everybody, welcome to this session entitled The Importance of Lifetime Follow-Up with Dr. Amanda LaGreca, endocrinologist. Dr. Amanda LaGreca is an endocrinologist, assistant professor of medicine of the Endocrinology Service at the University of Colorado. She completed medical school in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and then trained at Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut for internal medicine. Oklahoma University in Oklahoma for the Endocrinology Fellowship and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York for her thyroid cancer fellowship under the mentorship of Dr. Michael Tuttle. Her interests include the use of sonography in the evaluation of patients with thyroid nodules and cancer. Her current research centers on thyroid cancer aggressiveness in relation to dietary and lifestyle patterns and in molecular therapeutics of advanced thyroid cancer. Her clinical practice is entirely devoted to patients with thyroid cancer, with a particular emphasis on cases with aggressive disease and complicated management issues. I'll hand it over to Dr. LaGreca. Thank you, Matt, for such a kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy and so glad to be invited by Thyka to give this talk. I really enjoy this part of the year when I get to give this conference. And like Matt said, we're gonna hold into the questions to the end and then everyone would have an opportunity to ask me questions about um, uh, thyroid cancer. Um, and I'm gonna particularly talk today and it's a good wrap up of the conference of, this is a disease that requires lifetime follow-up and I'm gonna show you over the slides why is that. Um, and it's important to understand what is the risk of recurrence on thyroid cancer. So um, this is uh, this data from the NIH is um, available to everyone. It's open to everyone, and they annually release what is the estimated new cases of thyroid cancer in 2022, which is about 43,800. Um, and what are the estimated deaths in 2022, which is 2,230? So even though most of the patients have 98.2% um, uh, survival, um, successfully survived this condition, there's about 2% that succumb to their disease. And, uh, and those are mainly the patients that, uh, that we're all concerned. And that's why we never want to hear when they say this is the good cancer to have, because it almost like minimizes and, and takes away the importance of um, following up about um, your thyroid cancer. So um, if we look at this uh, publication, it's interesting the incidence of thyroid cancer up until 1990 or 1995 remained kind of stable. And this is the incidence per 100,000 people. But what happened in 1995, it's because we started to screen more, we started to see more patients that had incidental findings of thyroid cancer, like a thyroid nodule when they were gone for a, uh, a screening of their vessels on the neck or a CT scan done for another reason or a, an admission to the hospital for a uh, brain uh, hematoma and they do the CT scan and they find a thyroid nodule and that's how we discovered the thyroid cancer. But if you look at the lines, the bottom lines are um, the, the blue one, the light blue, it's poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, which remains flat. These are the aggressive thyroid cancers. And then the follicular thyroid carcinoma, it's also stable. So all the um, increase on the incidence of thyroid cancer over the years, uh, and this is from 1975 to 2009, it's at expense of papillary thyroid carcinoma and mainly the small little papillary thyroid carcinoma, which we don't really understand yet what is um, the outcome of those patients. And that's how some of the institutions are doing things like following up those patients without even doing surgery. Um, so I'm gonna go with a case. This is a typical case. This is, she's, she's a patient in my clinic. So all those things that I um, say are real cases. She's a um, 32 year old woman. Um, I met her a few years ago. She um, had already history of thyroid cancer and a lot of the care has, uh, was provided with a previous um, surgeon and endocrinologist, she said. 
I felt a lump on my on the left side of my neck. And then I decided to consult with my primary care physician. And the first thought was, well, maybe that's a lymph node that it's inflamed for any reason. And uh, we're gonna give you antibiotics and that's a very typical clinical scenario. And then she took the full 10 days of antibiotics and the nodule keep growing. And with more investigation, she has an ultrasound and she undergoes a fine needle aspiration biopsy. And she had a thyroid biopsy and a left cervical lymph node biopsy. So sometimes what we feel is not the nodule on the thyroid. We feel the lymphadenopathy, the already lymph node that has a spot of thyroid cancer that has traveled from that thyroid nodule to the lymph node. Both sites were suspicious for papillary thyrocarcinoma. Um, so if we look at the old times and uh, the uh, treatment on thyroid cancer has evolved a lot over the last decade, I would say, before that, every patient would get a total thyroidectomy. Every patient would receive radioactive iron and pretty high doses, 100 to 250 milligrams of iron 131. And we would suppress everyone on, with high doses of thyroid hormone to keep that TSH undetectable as part of the treatment of thyroid cancer. Now, as we understood better how it, what is the natural history of thyroid cancer, we may recommend partial thyroidectomy, which is just a removal of half of the thyroid, removal of one lobe. The American Thyroid Association says that if the uh, primary tumor could be up to four centimeters and there are no lymph nodes metastasis or involved on, uh, with papillary thyroid cancer, you could remove half of the thyroid. Um, some patients receive radioactive iron at different doses, 30 as an ablative dose. So you want to make sure that any normal tissue of the thyroid gets killed. Um, and this is achieved with low doses of radioactive iron. We wanna use it as a therapy. If we see lymph nodes that are suspicious, if we did have a pathologic report that showed involvement of the lymph nodes between 30 and 200 milligrams, or we could say, no, you are a low risk of recurrent for thyroid cancer, and we're not going to give you radioactive iron as the guidelines suggest. Um, we also give the thyroid hormone supplement, supplementation on different, with different TSH targets. Now, not everyone has to have a very, very low TSH. And we may need to give you a high dose of levothyroxine for one, two years, and then we relax the dose as we don't see any evidence of disease as we follow you up. Um, so what are the goals of the initial treatment? And with the initial treatment, I wanna say surgery plus minus radioactive iodine. Um, so we wanna remove the primary tumor and all the lymph nodes involved. So that is why it's so important that your doctor performs a uh, dedicated neck ultrasound before surgery, mapping your lymph nodes, so the first surgery would include the removal of the primary tumor and the lymph nodes, and you don't have to go back for a second operation. Uh, radioactive iron therapy, if indicated on the patients that risk of recurrence deserves treatment with radioactive iron. We wanna stage the thyroid cancer because that gives us the prognosis, right? So stage one, two, three, very good prognosis, stage four, not so much. So we wanna see how much um, care this patient needs, how often the follow-up needs to be done. Minimize morbidity. We don't wanna do a um, total thyroidectomy with dissection of the lymph nodes on the neck if the primary tumor is one centimeter and it doesn't have anything else because that adds morbidity to the patient and we um, impair the quality of life later on. We wanna lower the risk of recurrence with the initial treatment. So you wanna try and make sure that that cancer doesn't come back and you do as much as your effort on the initial treatment as you can. And also facilitate the long-term surveillance with the imaging studies and with our global panel, which I'm going to um, go in detail on the next few slides. So why do we need lifetime follow-up? And I'm gonna keep showing this case. So my patient, she 
Remember, she had a biopsy of the nodule and of a lymph node, which were positive for thyroid carcinoma. She had a total thyroidectomy and a left modified radical neck dissection. Those are wording that the surgeons used to say that the whole left side uh, underwent a dissection. And on thyroid cancer, we call um, berry picking, which is uh, uh, extracting the lymph nodes um, by just picking one or two. And that's been shown that it's not the appropriate care for uh, lymphadenectomy extraction, removal of the lymph nodes. We want to do a dissection. So a lot of patients end up having 40, 30, 20 lymph nodes removed. And out of those, a few of those had a spot of thyroid cancer. So she had a two and a half centimeter well differentiated thyroid carcinoma, papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is the most common of the thyroid cancers. 2.5, it's about an inch. Um, it's important to know if that tumor was containing to the thyroid or extra thyroid extension. So this tumor did not have any extra thyroid extension and did not have any vascular invasion. So we didn't see any cells traveling down the vessels. Um, 20 out of those 32 lymph nodes were positive for thyroid cancer. And it's important to know what's the size and if there's any spread of the lymph nodes outside. And those are the things that are a little bit more specific and we take care of that. <clears throat> and because she's considered intermediate risk of recurrence, um, she received a dose of radioactive iron and 100 milligrams of iron 131. And then she had a post-therapy scan, which showed aptic on the neck only. And I'm putting that there because almost everyone is going to have aptic on the neck after the whole body scan and the first dose of radioactive iodine because it's gonna light up those normal cells that are still there that are microscopic and the surgeon did not remove. And that's the purpose of these two. Um, so we staged thyroid cancer based on the eighth edition um, of the AJCC and that's the newest and they should stage you based on that. So it's important, not that I wanna go into details, but on younger patients and those changed from the seventh edition to the eighth, the age cutoff went from 45 to 55. So any patient that is less than 55 with no metastasis distally, that means outside the neck, meaning lungs, bones, et cetera, those are always going to be stage one. And if they do have metastasis outside the neck, those are gonna be to stage two. And this is for patients that are less than 55. It's a little bit more complicated on um, uh, older patients, more than 55, uh, but stage four, and a lot of patients ask me about this stage, stage four is, when the patient has a lot of invasion on the uh, organs in the neck, on the trachea, which is the windpipe, on the esophagus, which is the swallowing pipe, um, it could be encasing the vessels of the neck, or if they have distant metastasis, and the risk of mortality um, goes much higher. Now, um, how do we predict outcomes? How do we say this patient is gonna do well versus this patient is not gonna do so well, it's not gonna, or it's gonna need much more care. So what is the age of the patient? And I just show you, there's a cutoff between 55 and more than 55. Uh, it's important to read the operative report. So what did the surgeon find when they went into your neck? Was the tumor stuck into your organs? Was it extension outside the thyroid? Were a lot of lymph nodes looking abnormal? What is the pathology report? So this is what, um, after the surgery, they submit it and they tell me what's the size, what's the invasion, um, how many lymph nodes were involved, were those lymph nodes big? Um, and then of course, if there's a spread outside of the neck. So I talk about what is the risk of mortality and we uh, call that AJCC eighth edition. Now, the American Thyroid Association, the 2015 guidelines, developed the risk of recurrence. And this initially was published in the 2009 guidelines, and the 2015 added more information to that. So we divide the tumors uh, on three risks of recurrence. So we have low risk, intermediate, and high risk. 
And essentially, low risk tumors are those that are inside the thyroid, are less than four centimeters. There's no spread outside the thyroid gland. There's no evidence of big lymph nodes because up to five lymph nodes less than two millimeters are still considered low risk by the American Thyroid Association. Um, intermediate risk are those patients that could have a little bit of microscopic invasion, so very small uh, invasion outside the thyroid gland. Lymph nodes that are involved with thyroid cancer, aggressive histology, some of the tumors are more aggressive. Uh, there's a list of 20-something um, uh, types of tumors, so I'm not going to get into that, this, or if the tumor has vascular invasion. Um, and then the high-risk patients, the ones that recur more, um, do they have gross invasion? So a lot of invasion into the organs in the neck. Was that a complete resection or not? Does this patient has sites where we suspect distant metastasis? So all those things um, qualify for high risk. So we're very clear that the low risk patients almost do never need radioactive iron ablation or therapy. We're very clear that the high risk patients do need radioactive iron to decrease the risk of recurrence. We're always questioning this group. Most uh, endocrinologists, I would say, end up treating intermediate risk of recurrence. Um, but it has to do with a lot of factors and what type of surgeon you had, what type of surgery you have, what type of patient you have, what are the base comorbidities. So recurrence means growth of residual thyroid cancer, higher risk of resection um, if, higher risk if the resection was incomplete or if the cervical lymph nodes were involved up to 30%. And again, recurrence does not mean death, okay? This is what is the risk of having cancer or find cancer again, and mostly on the neck over the next few years. And again, these are estimates. So what do we want with this risk adapted approach and no one size fits all like we were doing? We don't wanna do total therapeutic radioactive iodine and TSH suppression on every patient. Not every patient needs that. So we wanna personalize care. We wanna, depending on the risk of the cancer, what is the treatment aggressiveness that we need? What is the conservative treatment uh, options? And it's important that you re-evaluate this always with your endocrinologist. At every session, you should have a discussion of how you're doing, what's your prognosis, what are the therapy tests that you need, what are the tests that are um, coming, do you need to see your endo every six months, every one year, every 18 months. So it's an ongoing thing. So how do we do the thyroid cancer surveillance? Physical exam, so this is done at the office of your endocrinologist. We follow the thyroglobulin panel, the TSH level to see if you're on the correct right uh, dose um, of the levothyroxine, if you need any, because some patients that underwent partial resection of the thyroid, they don't need any thyroid hormone supplementation. And then the neck ultrasound, which gives us a lot of information. It's a very sensitive test to detect abnormal thyroid, uh, lymph, uh, abnormal lymph nodes. Um, now, things that are, were used in the past and not so much are the um, stimulated thyroglobulin. Remember that they give you thyrogen or they do thyroid hormone withdrawal, the, which is stopping your thyroid medication for weeks. And um, it doesn't add more information now that we have very sensitive assays for thyroglobulin taking thyroid hormone. And then we're not routinely using whole body iodine scan on everyone. There are patients that we do, not everyone. And then additional tests depending on every particular case. So uh, what is the thyroglobulin? We all always talk about that. Um, thyroglobulin, it's a protein and it's made by normal thyroid cells and it's made by thyroid cancer cells. So on somebody who had thyroid surgery and receive radioactive iron, and we expect a thyroglobulin level, which is very, very low. Some patients are having undetectable levels. Some others have a level of one or two. 
Everyone has a different baseline, and that's our starting point. What is the level of the thyroglobulin after your surgery, plus minus radioactive iron? Um, if your TSH is very suppressed, so we give you, that happens when we give you high doses of levothyroxine, that could push the thyroglobulin down. So it could be almost like a falsely low reading. So be careful with that interpretation. Always ask your endo what's going on with that level of thyroglobulin. If you still have a little piece of normal thyroid tissue left in your neck, then that's going to give you a positive level of thyroglobulin, and that doesn't mean thyroid cancer. And then as the tumors become more aggressive, they do not make thyroglobulin very efficiently. So have to be careful on how to interpret those cases too. So what happened with my patient? She underwent surgery, which included a total thyroidectomy with a left modified neck dissection. She got radioactive iodine, 100. And then what happens with her thyroglobulin in 2013? She had a nice suppressed thyroglobulin level of 0.5. In 2014, she went to one, then 2.3, two, so stayed stable between 2015 and 2016. And then now 2018, she has a thyroglobin level of 7.8. So this is what I'm showing how important it is that you do follow up lifetime because thyroid cancer has a low mortality, but it could have different risk of recurrence. Uh, so what are the most common sites? And this is a question that I get every day by patients and my colleagues. And most of the times the thyroglobulin level at that level, lowish, around 10 or less, we have to look for disease on the neck. So I put neck, neck, neck. The other common sites that could go would, could be the lungs and then more advanced cases go to the bones. But I would say that 95% of the spread on thyroid cancer is on the lymph nodes on the neck. So what do we use for that? And then we do a neck ultrasound and you need a reliable place to have it done. Um, some of us, we do bedside ultrasound, some, of us, some send it to the university. Uh, we do what we call lymph node mapping and we look for abnormal lymph nodes on the neck. Um, we have about, 300 lymph nodes on the neck. So the surgeon never removes them all. So we always are looking for lymph nodes that could pop out on follow-up and they're abnormal. And this is a picture of the nodal compartment. So this patient has a dissection of the four um, level, which is usually around um, the, the, the vessels here on the lateral neck. So here and here, this is very common. The thyroid lies around here, and this is a very common site of metastasis. So normal cervical lymph nodes look like this. They're like bean type shaped. They have a bright area on the center, which is called the hilar line. So wording on the ultrasound report that uh, uh, suggest benign lymph nodes are reactive lymph nodes are usually meaning that the radiologist are, is thinking that they could be inflamed for another reason. Hilar line, it's a good sign also that the lymph node has still appearance of a normal lymph node. Now, um, I do ultrasound on this patient and then I find these nodes that are more suspicious, right? They're more rounded, they're hypoechoic, which is, means black compared to the other tissue. They have some vessels. And that starts concerns me a little bit. So what do we do now and what do I do? So first, um, do we need more surgery? And you could, that patient need, may need more surgery. Does she need another dose of radioactive iron? There are so many other options nowadays that uh, can we treat that lymph node with alcohol ablation? You know, there's a procedure that we do at the university, which we, um, biopsy the lymph node and we um, give alcohol and it kills that vascular supply, that vessel, and it almost stops the growth of those lymph nodes. And it's an option, not for everyone though. Do we need external beam radiation therapy? So that's um, radiation treatment, not iodine 
uh, not radioactive iron. This is external limb radiation therapy to that part of the neck that had an incomplete resection or has a lot of lymph nodes that are suggestive of thyroid cancer. Do we need systemic therapy? Those are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And those are more reserved for people who have distant metastatic disease on different parts of the body and are growing at the same time. So we start thinking on systemic therapy or, or do we just observe? Um, and observe and watch is hard to do for both, for the patient and for the physician, but a lot of time is an appropriate decision. And I wanna show you um, on, on, a, on the next slides what happens, but it's important that you have a multidisciplinary management approach on this, especially on the cases that are more complicated and need multiple decisions. I work at that way at the university and we have endocrine surgeons and we have radiation oncologists and we have nuclear medicine physicians and we have pathologists and we all get together and discuss these cases and come up with a plan that it's good for the patient and for the case. So we always try to individualize and not just do the same for every patient. And again, it's a particular personalized is the word today. It's precision, precision medicine. That patient needs that treatment at that time and it's different than the neighbor. Um, so some of these lymph nodes, and that's why I think observation is sometimes a good option. And again, I'm not talking about any particular case I'm talking about, but these are three cases. And this is a study published by E.L. Romenstock, who's one of my colleagues, he works in Israel, and he's been following, for example, case one. This is um, an abnormal lymph node, and I'm not sure if you could see these bright spots or calcifications, and calcifications on lymph nodes are usually um, a sign of um, metastasis, and he biopsy all of these nodules so to make sure that they um, did have a diagnosis of thyroid cancer, but look, three years, almost the same size and look at five years, same. So sometimes observation is a good option. Number two, this is a little bit of a bigger uh, node, kind of lobulated, very abnormal looking. Normal lymph nodes don't look like this. They're not lobulated. And again, nine years of follow-up. Look at the lymph node, it did not change. The case number three, same, this is the baseline. Again, look what happened at three years, almost the same, and 10 years, almost the same. So this is a very good option on this, on the, under the care of a physician who knows how to watch this. Um, so on the study that he published, um, growth of suspicious lymph node more than three millimeters, which we consider to growth, was seen in about 20% and more than five millimeters on about 9%. So that means that 80% of the patients or more, those lymph nodes do not progress. And this is a follow-up at two years. So only a small percentage of these cervical lymph nodes progress and the progression is very slow. So one take home point of this is one, not always every patient needs treatment for that specific lymph node. And number two is, do not panic. There's no urgency when your ultrasound shows an abnormal lymph node. It doesn't have to be seen within a week or so. We usually biopsy, we counsel, we follow a lot. Uh, so what are the additional tools that we use for detection? If let's say we look into the neck and there's nothing there, well, there's um, CT scans of the neck, it's looking at one, look at this lymph node, sometimes with the ultrasound that is just on the superficial area will not catch this one and it's deep. So when I don't find the lymph node and I'm having a patient with a thyroglobulin that's going high, I tend to um, order a CT scan if, I, if I'm not seeing that on the ultrasound. Um, chest X-ray for pulmonary nodules or a CT scan. See, this patient has small pulmonary nodules that could potentially on the setting of a rising thyroglobin represent thyroid cancer. Then the um, uh, iodine 131, you wanna see if there's any uptake on that, that we could treat it again maybe. And then PET CT scans, which is more reserved for patients who have higher levels of thyroglobin and that we suspect distant metastatic disease. So 
once you come to see us, let's say every six months, we, um, uh, the way the thyroid cancer experts work is this patient has different response to therapy. So we say, does this patient have excellent response to therapy? That means that I don't see any thyroglobulin that's concerning. All the imaging studies are negative. So the ultrasound of the neck is negative. And on my physical exam, the patient is doing well and I don't find anything. That's called excellent response to therapy. Biochemical incomplete is if I see a rise on the thyroglobulin, but I can't find the little spot on the neck or any other site. Um, and we start saying, okay, maybe we need to follow this patient closely because there's something, the, the, the tumor marker is very sensitive. So it usually rises before we could see anything on the imaging studies. Structural incomplete is that you already have a patient with some lymph node that has a biopsy, that has a spot of thyroid cancer, and you're just watching. Or in the terminate, you're like slow, um, uh, an abnormal lymph node on the ultrasound, a thyroglobulin that it's high, but not so high. So you call that indeterminate. And then depending on which box you're in, then your physician says, oh, okay, see me next year. In one year, we're just gonna do um, a um, non-stimulated thyroglobulin by you taking your thyroid hormone. We're gonna check an ultrasound every five years and that's it. Now, if you're indeterminate, then your doctor is still gonna see you every year but the ultrasound is gonna be done every one to three years um, and says consider stimulated thyroglobulin. That means giving you thyrogen or thyroid hormone withdrawal to measure that thyroglobulin. Biochemical incomplete, well, we follow them more often, like six to 12 months, and we consider other modalities to follow that patient and see why is that thyroglobulin going up and then structural incomplete again, six to 12 months. So in general, we don't follow earlier than uh, six months. I would say the exception to that are patients that are treating with systemic therapy and they see us at the thyroid um, multidisciplinary clinic maybe every two to three months to make sure that they're tolerating the medications okay, they're um, getting the imaging studies that they need, that's, those patients need a closer follow-up. So what is the goal of follow-up? Um, all patients need long-term surveillance and we wanna see if you're in remission and we call that after five years of not seeing anything, not thyroglobulin that is positive, imaging studies are negative. So we're gonna be less aggressive. And maybe when I see a patient that has shown me that in five years, there's no signs of anything, then I say, well, your next appointment is in 18 to 24 months. But we do wanna identify patients that have some residual recurrent disease. And we observe, we treat, we see them more often, we ask for more studies. So in summary, and then I'll take questions after this one is, when I see a patient that has a diagnosis of thyroid cancer, I do two things. What is the risk of mortality with the AJCC and what is the risk of recurrence based on the American Thyroid Association guidance 2015? After the patient has the initial uh, treatment, we reassess at every visit. And I, these boxes of excellent biochemical indeterminate or structural incomplete could change at every visit, right? I could have a patient that's having um, non-detectable thyroglobulin and then, well, for this next visit, his thyroglobulin went up to three and that's a biochemical incomplete response. And then instead of saying, well, you're gonna see me in one year, I'm gonna say, well, you're gonna see me in six years and I, in six months, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take another thyroglobulin level and an ultrasound. So I'm gonna be more cautious. Uh, so that means the more or less aggressive surveillance, depending the ongoing evaluations. I've seen recurrences up to 20, 30 years later of thyroid cancer. So this is not to uh, scare anyone, but I think we all have to know that we have that diagnosis, that we need lifelong care, and that wherever we go, we have to inform our doctors that we have a history of thyroid cancer, and if they could take that into consideration for, our, for the follow-up. This is my last one, and I'm happy to take any questions from the audience and try to um, get all the uh, um, dots that could come up answered. Okay, here we go. What do you know about cribriform morular 
variant <clears throat> and what should they watch out for in the future? They're about well, five weeks post-op. I know, five weeks? Yeah. So previform modular variant, it's a little bit more aggressive histology. So it's a typic, it's a, it's a type of um, a thyroid cancer. So <clears throat> it's also important to see what's the risk of recurrence based on the pathology report. Is this a big tumor, a small tumor, lymph node metastasis, not lymph node metastasis. So histology is into consideration, of course, of the aggressiveness um, of the tumor, but it also it's important to make sure that we take also into consideration is this is a big tumor. Did it go outside the thyroid? Are there a lot of lymph nodes involved? Um, was the surgery good or it was a complete resection? What was the operative report? And uh, in the long term, diet and exercise wise, is there anything that can be done to avoid recurrence or to have better overall health, easier, easier post total thyroidectomy? No, I mean, you said in terms of diet and exercise? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's important to always try to keep a healthy lifestyle. Um, I'm currently doing research on the NIH about the aggressiveness of thyroid cancer and metabolic factors. So are thyroid cancer, is thyroid cancer more aggressive on patients who are obese or sedentary lifestyle? And we are kind of seeing a trend on that, that we see, especially on women, um, uh, metabolic factors like obesity, sedentary lifestyle could be associated with more aggressive thyroid cancer. So I think I always counsel every patient, try to keep a healthy BMI, body mass index, try to exercise, try to eat healthy, um, a variety of things, less processed foods, but it, there's, not, there's nothing magic that could prevent the risk of recurrence. How do you test for poorly differentiated papillary thyroid cancer? And how do, how, do you, how do you test for poorly differentiated PTC? And how do you know if it's poorly differentiated or not? So the, um, the poorly differentiated thyrocarcinoma, it's informed by the pathologist. They follow index of things on the cells. Uh, there are two types of um, classifications that are followed for poorly differentiated thyrocarcinoma, and it has to be informed by the pathology. They look at necrosis of the cells. They looked at... Um, different things. And so that has to be informed on the PATH report. Uh, recently told by my endo that my Herthel cell carcinoma and papillary microcarcinoma are cured and no longer needs recurrent surveillance. Um, should they push for more testing? Okay. Uh, <laughs> So let's talk about papillary microcarcinoma. The risk of recurrence of a papillary microcarcinoma with no aggressive features, no extraterritorial extension, no lymph node metastasis is about one to 2%. So it's not zero, but it's very, very small. So once the patient has a resection of a papillary microcarcinoma, we almost think that the patient has been cured on quotations because we try not to use that word on patients who have a history of thyroid cancer. For heart cell though, they're usually um, also on the classification of what we call differentiated thyrocarcinomas, but they're a little bit more aggressive than papillary thyrocarcinoma. So I don't think anybody with heart cell carcinoma should stop follow-up. Um, there are some heart cell carcinomas that are less aggressive, especially let's say it's a five millimeter tumor, which was all encapsulated on the thyroid. We agree with that, but not that you could stop the follow-up forever. Mm -mm. How can you have a recurrence of thyroid cancer when you no longer have a thyroid, especially when there were no lymph nodes involved and radioactive therapy was given? Right. Well, so it depends on where the recurrence was. Um, that's, a, it's, that's a very good question. Once your thyroid is out, the recurrence 
is usually on the lymph nodes on the neck. And I'm talking about papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is the most common of the thyroid cancers. If we're talking about follicular thyroid cancer, the recurrence could be in other sites and less on the neck. So we call that recurrence, but it doesn't necessarily go on the thyroid because you don't have a thyroid anymore. It goes on the lymph nodes on the neck onto other sites. And it depends on what's the site of metastasis is the treatment that is given for that. So every patient is different. Like if the site of recurrence is the lungs, then that happens, you know, after 10 years of a total thyroidectomy and I see a patient with a rise in thyroglobulin and I check a chest CT and they have pulmonary nodules, sometimes those are metastases from thyroid cancer that at the time of diagnosis were very, very small, microscopic, and everything was negative. And over time, they grew to the size that we could see a rise on the thyroglobulin or a small nodule on the lungs. Why don't doctors in the U.S. and Canada biopsy nodules less than a centimeter? Very good point. Because the outcomes and the prognosis of a thyroid nodule that is less than one centimeter is almost less than one of one percent of those patients could have a bad outcome. Less than that. So that's why. Not that we say, oh, we don't do anything, but we just monitor those patients. Let's say you have a suspicious thyroid nodule of six millimeters. We don't say, oh, that's it, you're fine. No, we say, come back in a year and we do another ultrasound. And if the nodule continues to be six millimeter, then we keep watching. And then we do another ultrasound in two years. And then if the nodule grew three millimeters, then we're gonna say, okay, this time it grew, why don't we do an ultrasound in six months? So it's not that we're like forgetting about it, we're just monitoring. How concerning are papillary follicular, follicular variant carcinomas not found in highly suspicious thyroid nodules after recent lobectomy? Does it imply other carcinomas may not be visible on ultrasounds or other scans? What is the appropriate follow-up? <clears throat> Well, if the, um, it's a variant of papillary thyrocarcinoma, um, it, it, it goes back to, again, what's the size of the tumor? Was any vascular invasion? Was there any extra thyroid extension? If I have a patient that I sent for a lobectomy only for a three centimeter tumor that was biopsy benign, but the patient had a lobectomy, and it comes back as follicular variant of PTC with vascular invasion and some lymph nodes that are suspicious, then I would say, well, you know, we probably need completion thyroidectomy and maybe a dose of radioactive iron. But if this is an incidental finding and the patient had the lobectomy for another reason, and incidentally there's a four millimeter follicular variant of PTC, then I would probably observe, and that doesn't need an aggressive treatment based on the size and the uh, uh, no invasion to other structures. Do we have data on reoccurrence rates between five and 10 years for patients treated with a lobectomy only? We do, and in fact, where I train at Memorial Sloan in New York, they've been doing lobectomies only for uh, 30, 40 years. And, uh, it's the selection of patients that need a lobectomy versus a total thyroidectomy, which matters the most. The selection of a patient is important. If you are selecting a patient for a lobectomy only, and this is not the appropriate patient, then probably you're gonna find some disease later on. But the, the selection of patient was done well at initial, then I think conservative treatment um, preserving one side of the thyroid has shown a lot of benefits. Because one, some patients benefit from not taking any thyroid hormone supplementation after that. And two, the complications such as the hypoparathyroidism and the vocal cord paralysis are much less when you do lobectomy only versus total thyroidectomy. So for low risk tumors with no aggressive features, the data on long-term follow-up is very good as long as the selection of the patient for that partial lobectomy was done well. 
and kind of an add-on question to that. Um, is the long-term risk of recurrence higher if they're treated more conservatively, conservatively, for instance, with surgery only, or even just a lobectomy? Uh, not necessarily. It all goes back to what is, what is the type of tumor. And again, some patients are, we give them the option, hey, we, sh we could try a lobectomy, but when we see the path report, because remember the biopsy has that limitation that we see cells. And sometimes we have patients with a category that it's in between and it's called indeterminate. Um, uh, Bethesda three, four category, and then we send molecular markers and we still have not a complete risk of cancer. And um, if the findings on the PATH report are showing an aggressive tumor, then we say, well, let's go for another surgery. And yeah, that's two surgeries. But if a lot of num a number of cases are like, this is a low risk tumor, which was resected completely and no lymph nodes were involved. So I don't think it's gonna be a problem for follow-up. Does backing off of levothyroxine therapy after a couple of years of no recurrence then allow any residual thyroid cancer cells to be stimulated again? Well, we shouldn't be backing off levothyroxine therapy if we think there are some thyroid cancer. Uh, so I don't back off when I think there's a patient who's having thyroid cancer. Um, so the TSH suppression, it's only recommended by the guidelines on the high risk patients. And those are patients that either had distant metastatic disease or persistent disease that we try to keep them suppressed. The other case is the TSH suppression lifelong has not shown any benefits in farm. In fact, it shows harm, you know, osteoporosis and arrhythmia. So if I have a patient that has no evidence of disease or excellent response to therapy, I keep a normal TSH and I don't suppress that. But if I have a biochemical incomplete response with the theraglobulin at five that I don't know where it's coming from, or a lymph node that has a biopsy that was positive, I tend to not back off levothyroxine therapy. Those cases, yes, you could stimulate the growth. Is tall cell variant a low or intermediate risk for recurrence? So tall cell are usually higher risk of recurrence. Now there are, there are two categories. It's called tall cell features where 30% of the tumor or less have tall cells or a tall cell variant, which is more than 50%. So tall cell variant with more than 50% of those cells being tall, they do have a higher risk of recurrence and we treat more aggressively. Uh, patient had their total thyroidectomy in 2008, then had two high doses of REI, um, then had a right neck dissection in 2010. The thyroglobulin maintains around eight, suppressed TSH, currently only seeing an endo endocrinologist. Would you suggest they go to a multidisciplinary group? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there's definitely biochemical incomplete response, but at a low level of thyroglobulin. It never hurts to get one consult with, a, with an expert team. So I usually say, if you have the chance of going to a university where there's a team like us, or um, I, I do, we do a lot of those, you know, we see patients from all over the country for second opinion, and not that we're gonna steal that patient from your end, we're gonna say, yes, we agree, or no, we suggest this, or yes, we do more. And it could be a one-time consult. And then I work with a lot of endos outside Colorado to give them guidance. and. So if, is, if you're not um, happy with, or not happy, um, if you're like still confused about what is the meaning of the theraglobin and your endo doesn't give you a, a clear explanation for that, I would say go for a second opinion. Um, if it's coming up to your annual neck no ultrasound, should you wait on getting a COVID booster shot as a vaccine? which could make your lymph nodes enlarge. Yeah, that's a good point. In general, there's no data about it. 
So I'm, I'm feeling that I can recommend for or against that. If you are having a COVID infection, infection, not the shot, we've seen that some patients have what we call reactive lymph nodes and they look more inflamed on the ultrasound, although they look benign. Now with the COVID shot, I'm not sure if I can recommend for one or the other one. I think it should not give you inflammation of the lymph nodes. I don't think there's data for that. Um, it seems many clinics tend to stop following patients with imaging after five years if no reoccurrence is detected and instead follow with blood tests and physical exam only. But for patients treated with lobectomy, thyroglobulin is an unreliable marker. How can lobectomy papillary patients track potential reoccurrence over their lifetime? True. I mean, low risk patients, remember that the guidelines recommend annual thyroglobulin level and ultrasound every five years. Remember that if you were selected for a lobectomy only, that means that you're probably a low risk patient. Because if not, that would not be a good option. So to begin with, you probably have a low risk tumor that was treated with a lobectomy. So the risk of recurrence is very, very low. Uh, of course, you're still making thyroglobulin because your other side uh, of the thyroid makes, the normal cells make thyroglobulin. Um, so I don't tend to rely so much on thyroglobulin, but if it's a low risk tumor and there's nothing else, I think ultrasounds every five years is okay. And at some point, there's something that's called the trend of thyroglobulin. If you are not taking, let's say you're have a lobectomy and your post-operative thyroglobulin is 15, then I do check that annually. And if the 15 goes to 30 and then to 70, that's concerning. But if you remain on that level, that means that you're probably not having recurrent thyroid cancer. So even though it's not perfect, like on a patient with total thyroidectomy and radioactive iron, the trend of post-operative thyroglobulin on a patient with lobectomy could help a lot. Besides cost, are there any risks for doing frequent follow-up with any method? For example, radiation exposure. For example, radiation what? Radiation exposure or exposure to radiation. Uh, remember that the main study for follow-up on uh, thyroid cancer is an egg ultrasound, that it's totally no radiation exposure at all. Um, so... Maybe talking about CT scans, uh, which are not usually routinely used unless we're suspecting disease, or if let's say we're following a lymph node that is really deep and we can't. Um, no, but it's, I don't think we should order tests just for doing more on a patient who has a low risk cancer. Everything has to be, because it gives a lot of anxiety to the patient and to the physician too on, Let's say we check neck ultrasounds every three months. Let's say we, we say that. There's a lot of things that are going to be benign. Most of the things are going to be benign. And it's going to be inflamed lymph node that could look suspicious and recommend close follow-up. That gives a lot of anxiety to a patient. So the more we do, the more false negative results, you know, false positive results we find. And there's a very good study out of Memorial too that says that doing ultrasounds every year most likely finds negative results and just inflammation for other things that are not related to the cancer. So doing more doesn't mean we're gonna provide better care for the patient. Uh, what factors can make thyroglobulin measurement unreliable? And yeah, that's about it. Okay, so the main um, interference with thyroglobulin is the patient who has thyroglobulin antibodies. About 15% of patients who have surgery for thyroid cancer have um, evidence of thyroglobulin antibodies and that's the main interference. So when, um, when we have um, a patient with thyroglobulin antibodies, we tend to just follow the trend for the thyroglobulin antibody because you cannot rely on the thyroglobulin. I do tend to check the um, antibody on two different assays to make sure that they're both concordant and I'm not getting any surprise. And those are send out tests. 
So that's mainly, the other thing is that if you're not, let's say you forgot to take your thyroid pill and your TSH is 10, then your third cloning is gonna go up most likely. If you suppress your uh, TSH to 0 0.005, then your thyroglobulin is going to go down. So you always have to compare thyroglobulins at the same level of TSH suppression. Regarding a PET CT scan or a whole body thyroid nuclear scan to detect distant metastasis, which do you think is better? And should they bring on an oncology radiologist into the treatment team? So for the first part of the questions, it all depends. Um, it all depends. If, if the patient has gotten three doses of radioactive iron and the post-therapy scans have been negative, then I would be less inclined to do um, whole body scans to see if there's any disease, any persistent disease. If the patient has a rise in theraglobin and several doses of radioactive iron, then I would say, well, the guidelines say that if you have a D thyroglobulin more than 10 with a suppressed TSH and you can't find the source of the disease, you would order a PET scan. So it depends on for, for which, sometimes we order both and we're like, okay, we got a PET scan, we can't find it, we order a um, whole body scan. At, at that point, when if your endo is not finding the source and you're still having persistent rise on the thyroglobulin, I would say, yes, this is the time that you should consult with another team uh, that they see most, more of the advanced cases or more frequent cases of this and they give you more ideas. Because sometimes recurrent disease when it's still very small, it's very hard to detect. And we see that thyroglobulin level that is going up and we can't really find, and we have different discussions about what's the best test for that depending on the patient. Do anaplastic thyroid patients always have a history of previous thyroid cancer? Uh, that's a good point. We do think that anaplastic thyroid cancer arises on a more differentiated thyroid cancer. That is usually years, years ago. And sometimes we diagnose the patient with just anaplastic. So it probably, the carcinoma evolution starts with a differentiated thyroid cancer. That means the cell still preserves a lot of the normal thyroid cells functions. And then over time, it de-differentiates and becomes a poorly differentiated or anaplastic. Not always, because it's hard. studies like that are very hard, right? Because you, when you find the patient with a malignant tumor, you remove the thyroid. But we do think that sometimes it could come from a natural history of a low-grade tumor that progressed into a high-grade. I think we got to cover one last question. Um, okay. Does age affect risk, risk stratification? Um, they were a young adult, 2.1 centimeter tumor with vascular invasion, but they were told they were low risk. Yeah, totally. Younger patients have a much um, better prognosis than um, older patients, but it all depends on the tumor also. But yes, that's why the cutoff age for mortality is 55. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we are out of time. Okay. I do wanna say thank you for your time and sure. we'll answer all, as many questions as we could get to. Okay. I, I do apologize, we couldn't get to everybody, but okay. time is the limit there, so. All right, okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. Thank you, everybody, and okay. we'll see you later.